Praise the Lord. I believe that we are entering a time, and I'm not sure that this is something that it wasn't always accessible and always true, but I think there's going to be more of an emphasis on it because God is just taking mercy on us. How many of you like the idea when God takes mercy on you? I know one time that I was, actually I was in Mexico. We were visiting somebody there and the Lord spoke into my heart and he said, you don't call on my mercy enough because you and every one of my children need a lot of mercy because we are not all that in a bag of chips as far as our intelligence and wisdom is concerned. We really need his help. Do you realize that what's going on in the invisible atmosphere is extremely complex? People are where they are because of lots of background that you know nothing about. Thank God for his mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy on me. I need a lot of mercy in just ministering to you so that there will be word come forth that you didn't just walk out of this service, heard another good word. Or maybe you don't say good all the time, Tony. Maybe Tony is saying, well, what's the cliff notes on that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, Bill's got you back. Yeah. But I think we've entered into a time where the truth is seeking you. Now, let me contrast so that you'll have a backdrop for that statement. There is a lot of emphasis in a lot of teaching, press into God, glory to God. If you will just press into him, then he will respond to you. But if you don't really press into him with all your heart, then you can't expect anything out of him. He's waiting for you to really press in. Do you hear how religious that is? That's really religious. I mean, I'm talking about dead religion. Just like I said with doctrine and theology last week, there's nothing wrong with doctrine and theology in and of themselves. There's just systems to help us focus on thoughts and packages of what we believe. Except that, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, you guys keep fighting with each other because you think you have doctrinal theological arguments because you think that in the scriptures that you argue about, that's where life is found. You know, if you got the right doctrine, then you end up with abundant life. You know that God is big enough to give abundant life to people that have a very messed up doctrinal system in their belief. If God is limited by the accuracy of what you believe, you are in a lot of trouble. But the fact is that the scriptures bear out, and I only re already read one of them that Cable showed me. Before you asked, I answered. The truth is that there's a very powerful principle in the grace and mercy of God. And this is really what grace and mercy is. The truth is seeking us. And our part is to respond to the gentle nudge. Isaiah 53, 6 says, we all. Are you included in all? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And that's in a sense of, and we continue to keep doing that. <laughs> we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Can I say it like this? Each of us has turned to our own opinion. That is not the whole truth. This is a year for me where I want to start listening for the whole truth. And even in people I disagree with, 
politically and otherwise. I want to ask the Lord, where is it that they're coming from? Because I have a sneaky suspicion that they as individuals have a reason why they've come to that conclusion. And I'll bet that they're not just a wicked piece of trash who's out to destroy my life. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity. The wrong parts of the opinion. The wanderings of us all. It says in Matthew 18, 12 to 14, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. And can I lift that word should perish out of the doctrinal st uh, statement that people automatically think and shall not burn forever in hell? It didn't say that. We perish in life while we're alive. Do you know that Jesus came to do more than give you a ticket into heaven? One of the things we overlook, we put an emphasis on the cross of Christ. And rightly so, Gary, because it's powerful. But we put a tremendous emphasis on the cross of Christ and we totally ignore three and a half years of teaching. The cross of Christ happened. And there was a spiritual transaction there that was very important. But before he even went to the cross, he talked for three and a half years about how you can apply the cross. So what we need to do, Barb, is we need to spend more time this year paying attention to the teachings of Jesus. And to the actions of of Jesus because those are really important because the power of the cross is all about or it's not all about just getting you into heaven when your heart beats its last beat that's really important it is about forgiveness but you know what Gable you and I both need forgiveness in this earth too not for after we die, but right now as we are living and bringing relationship back together, bringing fellowship back together. I'm going to repeat this since we're just we're live now. What I told you earlier that the Spirit of God said the way to pray for this country or broken places in your home, pray for an outpouring of the Spirit of fellowship. That doesn't seem like a, a solution. What? Because we have too light of an idea on what fellowship is all about and what the power of fellowship is all about. Because fellowship is all about relationship and there is nothing more powerful than relationship, either for the evil or for the good. It is the power of relationship. That's what the story of the Tower of Babel is all about. They could do anything in a relationship where they understood each other and worked together. It's like I preached a message back years ago called Faith is Easy. We talk too much about, well, man, faith is so hard. Faith's easy. It's not that having faith, you're born as a child of God, as a believe, you believe stuff. It's easy to believe stuff. You automatically, we ought to all automatically do that. It's not whether or not you can believe, it's what you do believe. It's what you believe is the thing that has to be worked on. That's when we talk, why we talked about and that whole thing of your butt's too big. You know, God has a promise and you quote that promise. 
Yes, amen, brother. I believe my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Uh, but right now, it doesn't appear like he is because I owe the light bill and they're getting ready to turn him off. Okay. I recognize that we all get attacked with that stuff. Natural things happen. You know, I just, I just preached last Sunday in the, this intervening year, this, this gap year in a sense, that the, and I'm going to read the prophecy to you again that I preached, uh, that I had last week from Bob Jones, that we are entering into the, the time of rest. And I woke up to Tuesday morning trial. And it didn't last long because I went to my secret place. And then God confirmed a lot of things over the process of that day and the next day and showed me how he had my back and is continuing to show me these different things like with my wife's health. Hi, honey, you're watching right now. I know that. With my wife's health, how he was notifying other people about it that didn't know anything about it naturally. He's got our backs. He is answering before we ask. But as we begin to believe that, Celeste, there's a lot less torment in our lives. See, part of salvation has to do with an eradication of torment as we're walking this natural earth life. You don't have to live in misery. I think it was, I, I can't remember the name of the author. It was a woman's author years and years ago. But, and I'll probably get the title uh, not quite exactly right. But she said, problems are normal. Misery is optional. Yeah? Jesus said it this way. In the world, you will have tribulation. But if you're miserable over it, that's your fault. Because you can be of good cheer because I have overcome all of that nonsense that's in the world that keeps it. And that takes on all kinds of forms, all kinds of worries, all kinds of broken relationships, all kinds of stupid things people say to you and offend you with, all, all kinds of stupidness because you allowed yourself to be offended. You know, maybe we need to de develop a little thicker skin and not be so reactive because we are living in the secret place. Hallelujah. In the same way your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. See, that's really the truth seeking you. You don't have to worry, Gary. He is coming to us before we ever respond to him. He is bringing the truth to us before we ever respond. So this is a worry you can check off your wish list, worry list. You don't have to be worried about being dedicated enough to find the Lord. What if I mess it up? What if I sin? What if I say something wrong to the wrong? What if, what if, what if, what if? Let me tell you a little game you can play with this whole what if thing. Because I know back, back when my wife was having uh, cancer surgery years ago, and Denise was with me in the waiting room, and uh, I was saying what if, what if, and she was saying it's not what if, it's what is. And so focus on the what is. That's one of the ways to go on the diet, Deborah, to make your skinny up your butt. <laughs> the stuff you're eating. The stuff you're worrying about. What are, you, what are you putting into your system? Okay. But there is another flip side of that that gets kind of fun that helps start attacking that system of worry that is so well entrenched within you. And that is go ahead and play what, the what if game. But instead, say, what if this turns out better than I ever anticipated? What if this actually happened? You know, because it's at least 50-50 possible just by natural circumstances. 
And then when you add God to the equation, it's better than 50-50 that it's going to turn out for your benefit. Yeah? So your plan... See, the abundant life means that you have the advantage. You're always going to be at the, at the advantage if you learn to live there in your mind. Don't automatically assume that something was meant to destroy you or hinder you. God may have meant it for your good. Now that doesn't mean that he'd, you know, there's that old thing that says, you know, if you get a good word, Murphy's Law, if something bad's going to happen, <laughs> it's going to happen at the worst possible time to me in my life. We're all really well acquainted with Murphy's Law. But we're not as acquainted with the fact that there's a law that trumps Murphy's Law. It's the Master's Law. The Master's truth is God will supply all of your needs all of the time before you ended up actually needing it. When am I going to get a miracle, Lord, when you need one? A lot of people are asking God for miracles and they don't need a miracle. They need, to, they need number one, they just need to go on a skinny butt diet. And they stop, stop butting the promises of God. Well, stop comparing them with the, what is apparently your circumstance at the moment. You know, that, that, just that, Gary, that phrase right there, that was worth the power, that was worth the price of admission. By the way, thank you for your tithes and offerings. That was worth the price of admission. It's time to change our diet, go on a diet this year. But this diet isn't going to add to your butt. It's going to skinny up your butt and it's going to give you power to live in the abundant life. Does it mean that you won't be attacked with negative things? We live in a negative world. That's why he says all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. You know, there's a, a few weeks ago the Lord emphasized to me again as I was waking up the scripture that says, if you delight yourself in the Lord he will give you the desires of your heart and I said yeah Lord I and I do I intentionally delight myself in you and all of a sudden something hit me see the truth was seeking me I wasn't having to run after it and have it run away from me like a butterfly it was seeking me and all of a sudden I thought wait a minute how much stuff is not happening in my life that are the desires of my heart because I don't believe that I don't delight myself in the Lord Gary to be all spiritual I delight myself I said I delight myself and there was certain and I'm not going to put it on Facebook live but there was a particular thing that came to me There's my, and I said wait a minute I delight myself in the Lord and unless he changes that desire this is what I want, Lord, this year. This is what I'm expecting to happen. And then you know what I did? I moved into that realm of, in my science, my quiet time, I started seeing it in my imagination as if it had already happened. And I started feeling it, and I started being grateful for it happening, as if it had already happened. It, I'm not giving you some kind of new age mumbo jumbo. Remember the Lord spoke to me that about that 35 years ago before I had even heard there was a new age. He asked me a question. I was praying for an individual. And he asked me a question. What would it look and feel like if I answered that prayer? And said, so that's all I'm doing right now. What are you asking the Lord for? Well, what would it look and feel like? Instead of focusing on what it looks and feels like as you're focusing on the external world, what would it look like if God wasn't lying to you? 
<laughs> the truth is seeking me. I'm just say that with me. The truth is seeking me. The truth is seeking me. But here's the second part of that. I choose to respond. I choose to respond. The truth is seeking me, and I choose to respond. Now start paying attention to those little nudges that I, I don't know why I even thought that. Somebody, I just Facebook friended somebody this morning. I saw an article that they wrote. In fact, I posted it. If you want to go on to my status, uh, that it would be before or below this particular. It was about a man. He was talking about what the fear of the Lord actually is. It was really good. And so I went to this gentleman's website, and I, a Facebook site, and I requested to be, become friends with him because I really liked what he had to say. And then I gave him a little bit of my testimony. And he just, I just read it about a half hour ago. He responded to it, and he said, that's where I came from. Ah, that's exactly where I came from. And I don't know why. I just all of a sudden had a thought that started changing my feelings on the inside. And I can't credit myself with being so smart. I just started having a revelation that started opening up my whole attitude to what God is. And that's what happened to me. All of a sudden I started questioning some of my long-term fundamentalist doctrines. And then, not only question it, then I began to research it. See, if you get a revelation and it leads you and you believe it's something, and how do you know if it's a revelation or not? It's not going to necessarily be something that reinforces what you already believe. It's going to be something fresh and new. It's something you hadn't thought about. So how do I know if it's a revelation or not? It depends on what feelings come with it. If it goes, huh, that sounds cool. That sounds too good to be true. But that's, huh, that brings me joy. Then what you do is then you partner with God and seek out that matter and start studying information on that and start studying the scriptures. Not to reinforce your previously held belief system, but to see some fresh light on what the heart of God actually is. Did you know God wants all of us to really know what his heart truly is for us? So let me finish this in the next five minutes. Bob Jones 2020 prophecy. The 2020s will reveal the rest of God. To where the body will come into a place of resting in God. Where God will rest in us. And in this rest, the enemy will not be able to do warfare because we are resting in God and he is resting in us. And he will accomplish the things he means to do in a people that is at rest. He has always wanted a people that will come into his rest. Hallelujah. But it's progressive. It doesn't just come like that. It's something you start skinnying up your butt, but you don't worry about having to press. Just start meditating on and pondering all of the promises God has already made you. And then he will add to that as you then research it out with him and search the scriptures and search the teaching of Jesus. You know, I like especially Barb, I like it sometimes where he says, you've heard it said, then he's quoting an Old Testament scripture, and he adds, but I say, wait a minute, tilt, tilt. Jesus said, you've heard it said, that must have really torqued the Pharisees. You've heard it said, but I say, now here's the thing. I'll just emphasize 
this one story out of the scriptures as we apply to it. Do you realize that when the, the land that he's prophesied for the 20s, 20s is the promised land for us? But it's progressive. And we have to intentionally walk with God in it. And he's giving us mercy because he's approaching us with nudges and suggestions and revelations of deeper truth about who he really is. And our part is to respond. And to give him honor for the fact that I hadn't, man, I would, hadn't thought of that. That's cool. I hope that's true. That's too good to be true. Well, follow it up. It's probably really true as it has to do with God and his true heart. But in 1 Samuel 17, we read about David and Goliath. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. You know, Goliath is coming after us all of the time. Celeste, you know, all of those things we talk about, what we worry about, that's Goliath. It's also known as the flesh. It's also known as the inner critic. But Goliath is constantly on the attack in our lives. And even as uh, the devil said to Adam in the garden, did God really say? How many times have you ever said that? Did God really say? And then he'll show you something going on in your circumstances where all of a sudden your butt gets too big again. But David said to the Philistine, and this is how you respond to that, and we'll talk more about this next week probably. Lord willing, and I think he probably is willing, if the creek don't rise and we don't get a huge snowstorm. <laughs> I've got people watching in all parts of the world right now. And uh, some of them are snow. They don't even know what snow is. I mean, except for what they've seen, you know, South Africa and southern parts of Africa. And, uh, you know, there's for all over the world. Anyway, as a matter of fact, you can comment on there as you're watching this, even if it's a rebroadcast. Tell me where you're from. Just put in where you're from on there. Cool. Um, he responded this way. And this is the way for you to respond to any Goliath that comes at you. Now you're going to want to listen, Bill, to this real close. Why are you going to want to listen to it real close? Because right after it, I'm going to say in Jesus' name, amen. And that's going to be the end of the message. So you want to get this. Because this is the way you go after Goliath. When he come, whatever form he comes in. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, or the people of God, whom you are defying. Once more, you come against me with a sword and a spear. And that's scary. And a javelin. Whoa, they got to turn off my lights. But I come against you in the name and the character and the reputation of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of the people of God, whom you are right now defying. In the name of Jesus, amen.